following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Continuing with uh, with the mysterious tetragrammaton, which, was, as you know, is a Greek word. Tetra is four, and gramma is letter. So when you say tetragrammaton, it's related to the uh, the name or the four-lettered phrase related with, uh, with sacred mantras. <clears throat> Not only the yod he bab he is a tetragrammaton. In Latin, for instance, we have uh, the famous Ingri, which is always on top of the cross. And uh, this is a, a word which means ignis natura renovatur integra. The fire renews nature constantly. As well, Following the lecture that we were given, or that we are given, here, for instance, in Qatar, that we were stating that the mantra means Ja, also you find another tetragrammaton, which is uh, written in the book of Exodus given unto Moses. <coughs> and this is the uh, Eheye, which is uh, that phrase that uh, Keter pronounced in front of Moses when Moses asked to his inner particular individual God, what I'm going to say to the Israelites in Egypt if they ask me your name. And then he says, Eheye, Asher, Eheye. Which in the Bible is translated as, I am what I am. We said also, I am the one that is. If we inquire in this uh, phrase pronounced by Keter, which is Ja, and as we said, this is related with Elijah, or Elijah, which is my God is Ja, it implies something that is permanent. We will say the omnipresence of God. 
She didn't say, I am the, the one that was or the one that will be. Ehe ashe ehe means I am the one that is. I am the one that am. Is something that is related to the moment, to the present. It is written that God is omnipresent. There is uh, a way in order to in order to understand. In order to understand that we have to be here and now. In order for us to be one with that. To live the present, to live the moment, is always a requirement for the self-realization of the being. An eternal present. Remember that when we remember God, we have to identify with that phrase. He is. So therefore, if He is, we should be. But to be is not a matter of being, as we think, but of existing as we think. People think that to be is to exist. And this is something different. Anybody can exist. But to be is to live the moment. To be inside. We normally are always outside of ourselves. Remember that Ehe, ja, is here. Of course, we have to understand that uh, when we study the tree of life and we place the sephirot, we find there, look, the first triangle, the logoi tri triangle, that Lokoi triangle is related with the head. And of course, in the head, we have these three primary forces. We say these uh, three primary atoms related with uh, three magnetic centers in the head. That or those three particles of God or atomic forces. We said atomic from the point of view of small. Not that they are atoms, physical atoms, but atomic because they are igneous particles located in the eyebrows, in the middle of the eyebrows, in the magnetic center of Keter. In the pituitary gland, we have that other atomic force of Hohma. And in the Pinia gland, we have the atomic force of Bina. So this is what we have, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three primary forces are in the head. And of course, when we work with this remembering of ourselves, the center of gravity of that self-remembering, that I am what I am, is always in the pineal gland. Pineal gland is a center related with a chakra, Sahasrara, which is the crown chakra, the chakra related with Keter. So then you remember God there. When you are remembering and centering yourself within your body, because this is the body that we have, that we have to work with, there is the state of the soul. Because we are that soul. We have to sit 
in this vehicle. We, we are, as consciousness, as souls, we have to sit on our body. We have to control this body. And of course, the seat of the soul is the pineal gland. But this, the consciousness, the soul, has to be there. I mean, we have to be there. Because we are that. And if we are not remembering that we are in the body, that the body is a vehicle that we have to observe and to control, and then we are out of the ground. We are out of that phrase that says, Hey, hey, yeah, I share. Hey, hey, yeah, I am the one that I am. That's why we always insist that the first step on the path is to remember God. Not to imagine God. To remember. That remembrance is related with the moment, because God is not from the past, is not from the future, is an, etern an eternal, an in, in eternity, here and now, in this present, in this moment. So therefore, if you are there in your pina gland, feeling yourself there in the presence, and then you are sensing the presence of your own particular crown, Get there. That's the beginning. Because of course, you know, the whole entity of Keter goes beyond your pina gland. But uh, the pina gland, the chakra Sahasrara, is connected to that force. And we are then to sit in that pineal gland, that's the beginning, to be awakened in the physical body. And then we are. Know that we are going to be 100% Keter, because unfortunately we have many Baalim, many egos. But at least we do it with the, with the effort with the percentage of consciousness that we can manage. And while we walk in the path, we increase the amount, the percentage, in order to be more and more aware of what we are. Of what we are in reality, not what we imagine. So this is that what we have to understand and comprehend that God is an eternal presence, the being, that is. And this is how little by little we are experiencing that which people call God, which has no form. I am, I am the one that I am, that means Let's be here. Remember yourself. <laughs> so you see, and that's why when Moses is before the uh, uh, God going to work there in Egypt, which is the physical plane, that's why God says, go there and tell him, I am the one that I am. Doesn't mean that Moses descends and says, "I am that I am uh, that I am." Send me. It means that when you descend to work in yourself and your psychology, you have to do it consciously. Your intellect, the Pharaoh, is always questioning you. And the only one to understand and do the miracle that Moses, which is willpower, dilemma, did before the Pharaoh, is by remembering yourself. 
by bringing that energy from above, because the battle is within, not without. This is a personal, individual work that we have to perform. Only God can help us. But if we forget God, if we think that God is something else, and we don't understand that we are part of Him, and that He is the present, the consciousness, and that we are just managing the matter, then we fall into Maya, illusion. We have, of course, to discover that by doing it. Because this is how we discover that phrase that says, Men know thyself. Homo no se te ipsum. Men know thyself. But that self is not the body. That self is the reality in us, which is Keter. But since we are always out of ourselves, we are identified with the matter, and we think that, many people think that what we are is the physical body. People think that when the physical body dies, we cease to be. Because they are identified with the body. The body is simply illusion. That's why we said the body is Maya. It doesn't, it has no reality. Today we are being born, and after a few years, 50, 60, 70, 80, the body goes to the ground and disappears. Everybody will die. Physically. But we are. And that that, that we are is precisely the consciousness. People sometimes say, my consciousness, my spirit. And why do they say that? Because they think that they are the body. We should say, my physical body, the vehicle in which I live and manifest in this three-dimensional world. But I am not the physical body. And who are you? This is precisely the point where you have to ask, who are you? What are you doing here? When you feel that uh, zealous for your inner being in that way, in which you just want to be there inside of you without forgetting that, but you are that zealous is precisely what we should develop. Because it's written that uh, God is a, is a zealous God. But uh, no, that type of, uh, we will say, jealousy, egotistical elements that we have within, is that zealous that we feel towards ourselves. And we forget ourselves, we are not acting with that zealous. That passion, we will say. It's coming into my mind, for instance, uh, Ramakrishna, the great uh, yogi from India. He decided to stay here now and to devote himself to the Divine Mother, second after second. And he didn't go and he says, I'm going to punish myself if I forgot for a second my Divine Mother. Because he understood that the whole work that we had to perform lies on the Divine Mother. 
So there was a moment in that he forgot for a while. And when he realizes that he forgot his Divine Mother for a few minutes, and then he was doing penances. Because he wanted to be zealous in that way, to stay always there. That's to be awakened. To be awakened really is something very difficult, because it's to remember your own deity. But not imagining, sensing it in the percentage or in the amount that we can do it. And that is, that is precisely the, the point when you are in between the two forces, as we explain that Malkut is between a mesocosmos. That mesocosmos, Malkut, is related with the physical body that we have. So, Malkut is also our own particular physical body. And the physical body has the infra dimensions. Some of you read in many books of the Master Samael on the Or about the atomic infernos of the human being. Well, the atomic infernos of the human being are precisely the clipotic forces in us. Atomic, micro forces, together with the ego. Those atomic infernos or inferior forces within us is what in psychology is called subconsciousness, unconsciousness, infra consciousness. All of us have that. And of course, we ignore about that. We don't know that. There are people that go to the psychologist <coughs> in order for a psychologist to help them to deal with those psychological elements that they cannot deal with. Of course, in this case, we have to deal with that. We have to know ourselves. We have to control that. The only psychologist that we need in order to perform the work is God within. But we have to invoke it. We have to remember And this is how we know our own particular inferior dimensions, our own hell, because we live in hell. And this is precisely the point. People think that hell keeps both the infernos is something that they will experience with nature. Sometimes, when somebody has nightmares, experience that. But most of the time, we live in hell. We live in the infra dimensions. We live in the subconsciousness, unconsciousness, infra consciousness. Our own particular atomic infra dimensions. Once in a while, we experience the supra dimensions or the parts that are above the physical plane. Remember that when we said the physical plane, we said our physical body. Because this is the only thing that we can experience as consciousness. The element that is that we use, that we move. That is the only way in which we are going to experience this. Not outside. Outside, of course, this is three-dimensional too. But the only reality within you is what is inside your body. See, for instance, you, five, you have five senses. All what you hear, see, smell, taste for your five senses 
centers through those windows. Without the five senses, you are just a physical body. You are inside there. So that's your reality. You see this Bible? That is only, what you see here is the image that is there, which your eyes are capturing. But the reality I have it in my hands. This Bible cannot be in your head. Just the image of it. And what you have, what we have inside, it's what we have to deal with. Nobody is outside. There are many people that identify with the outside world. And they want to fix the outside. Meanwhile, you can do whatever you do in the outside world, but if you don't change, if you don't be conscious, cognizant of what you have within, you are not awakened. So that's the point. In order to know yourself, in order to know ourselves, we have to sit in the body and to control that robot, which is the physical body, and to observe what is wrong with this physical body. You know, some, some of us have physical illnesses, but uh, are we really using the body in the way that we should, we should use it, or who is using it? Is God there, or is not there? It's coming to my mind, Jesus entering to the temple of Jerusalem with a whip and whipping the merchants out of the temple. People think that that uh, just happened physically. That's just a symbol. The whip is willpower. Entering into the temple means to enter into your own body, your own mind. What do you find there? Merchants. And then you have to take them out. He says, my body, my physical body, has to be the temple of Jah. But that whipping and taking out of, of the merchants of the temple is not easy. People that, we will say, elements, psychological elements, that make business or that make trades with the energies that we have in the body in order to be satisfied. Those elements are the seven heads of the beast that everybody has within. The Baalim says Elijah, or we will say lust. Anger, pride, greed, vanity, laziness, gluttony, and all those psychological defects that we have in abundance. We have to fight against them. Or we have to have, we have to decide. This is why we said that Elijah came in front of the people and said, You have to decide if Jehovah, Jehovah is God. Follow him. If not, follow Baalim. And then you, and, you, and then we are in the same position. Below we have the infra dimensions, and above heaven, inside, we have connections. We have the glands. We have the forces. We have to decide what to do. If we decide to go up, and then the upper forces come and put us on the path. Because there are hierarchies, there are forces that people call angels. In all of this way in which we enter into the path of the initiation, or the path of the self-realization, is inside. Of course, in this physical world, we teach, we guide, we say, but in the end, what matters is what happens within. Outside, there are many philosophies, schools, organizations that give initiations. 
And if you belong to this group, you receive this initiation or that. But if you don't experience that within, it doesn't count. You can receive hundreds of initiations in this physical world. But if you don't experience that in your consciousness, but there are many people that believe in God, but if you don't experience God in your consciousness, it's worthless. Many people that don't believe in God, so what? What matters is to experience that, to have faith. No beliefs. And people mistake beliefs with faith. This is something different. Faith is experience of the consciousness. If you have faith, you have no doubts, because you see it, you touch it with your soul, with your consciousness, with your senses, with your chakras. So we need to, to walk the path. And that is always shown in all the books, all we are explaining here. The first thing is that the initiator had to put us in the path or on the path for the self-realization. And who is that initiator? Let me tell you first uh, in Hebrew. It's a Kerub. Let me tell you in Greek. Is Prometheus. And now I'm telling you in Latin, is Lucifer. That is the initiator. He is the one that plays you on the path. Because he is the one that can pick you up or down. Lucifer is a stairs to heaven or stirs to hell. It depends how you use it. It's energy. The energy that is in your donkey, in your body. Of course, uh, related with Elijah that we are talking here, after he confronts Jezebel, or better said, Ahab, which is the intellect, the messenger of Jezebel, and invoke Jehovah, the AEA, the force, the fire of God, in order to make the sacrifice. It is written there in the chapter 19 of the book of Kings. That I have the intellect goes and tells Jezebel what Elijah did that he uh, showed to the people of Israel that they should go up towards heaven in the civilization. Jezebel obviously which is, is the queen of all that that we have within because this is our mind. Who is the queen of your body, your mind, the intellect. And then Jezebel says, well, go and tell Elijah that tomorrow at this time I will do the same thing that he did against the prophets of Baalim. And I don't care if the God had more karma to me. And this is what happened to any one of us. Our mind, the protoplasmic elements that we have within, which belong to nature, that evolved from the mineral kingdom to the plant kingdom to the animal kingdom, and now in which level that we are, that we are intellectual animals, all of that belongs to nature. The body that you have belongs to nature. It's a gift given to you. Your mind also belongs to nature. That's Jezebel. We serve nature. And nature is going to fight with all of its strengths 
in order to avoid you to enter into your own self. Because that matters to conquer nature. That's why it's difficult. It's not easy to become a human being into the image of God, dominating nature, dominating the four elements, the forces. So that you have to fight against those forces that make you a robot, like make you mechanical, make, like make you to identify with nature and the universe. It's not that you're going to fight against certain groups or certain beliefs. No, you're going to fight with, against yourself. That's the great war. That's the Mahabharata. They fight against yourself. Nobody can help you. Only God, which is within, if you remember Him. Because if you lose your remembrance of your inner being, you are lost. We are always in contact. Or he, he might be in contact with us if we remember Him. That's why the first commandment says, You shall not make any image. Because God wants to help you. But if you put between God, your, your inner God and yourself, many images or many idols, how that force will come in, into you. And those idols are there. At the barim of your mind. And not outside. I know those statues that people think that are in churches. No. Those idols are within. And against those we have to to fight. And the one that plays us on the path is the one that knows very well how how we are. And that is our own particular groove. That force. That groove says that when Elijah heard what Jezebel said, he was afraid and went into the wilderness. That, of course, is a symbol. And what you have to enter into the path, you have to confront yourself. And it's written there that he went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And he, he is remembering his own God and recognizing that he has to die. Yeah, I have to die. I prefer death than anything, he says. Of course, he's not talking about physical death but psychological death. The same thing happens with Jesus. When he goes into the Jordan and he is baptized, and the Holy Spirit enters into him in a form of a white dove. And what happened after that? He's taken into the wilderness, being tempted by the devil. It says that the Spirit took him into the wilderness in order to be tested. This is something that we have to understand. That wilderness symbolizes life. Once you confront and say you have decided to walk on the path of the self-realization of your being, And then you have to be initiated. And the first step is to work with the waters. In every religion, you always find that the first step to enter into the path is to be baptized. And of course, everybody celebrates that symbol. Any religion. And of course, it's always ready with the waters. But if we go into the tree of life, 
we find that the waters are related with Yesod. Because we are talking here about the Tetragrammaton, which are related with the four elements. And the, four, and the first one is Yesod. You see, after Malkut, Yesod. Now the first step. But in Yesod, which is the nine sphere, according to Dante Alighieri, when he descended into the ninth sphere of the earth, he found there Lucifer. Of course, this is not a spiritual entity there, but you see how the sexual force. The sexual force, the sexual energy, which is within the waters. The waters are the seminal sexual force, the semen, the sperm. For us, in Gnosticism, the woman has semen as a man. Of course, it's feminine, no masculine. And instead of having the uh, soul sperms, she has ovums. The two polarities are there. So then you find there that those forces, the ovum and the sperm, is where you find the image, which in Hebrew is salim, the salim, the image of God, the very power, the power of creation. This is what we need. It's not only to remember God, that's the first step, but we have to give strength to the pineal gland. And when you study endocrinology, you know very well that the pineal gland is related with the sexual glands. The hormones of the pineal gland help the development of the sexual organs. And the hormones of the sexual organs help the development of the pineal gland. And in the pineal gland is the seat of the soul. And if you have a strong pineal gland, the strongest is your remembrance from God and the awakening of your consciousness. We all hear the secret of the circumcision, which means the cut of the bestial sexuality and the birth of the spiritual one. And that's precisely the going into the baptism. People celebrate the baptism <coughs> in their old religions, but when they marry, when they should practice and perform that baptism in reality, they don't do it. Because they have to baptize themselves in the waters of sexuality. That's the first element. He said that the ordeal of water, you have to adapt to a new situation. And that's the first step, to adapt to a new life. Your old life, you have to renounce that. And what is that? Renunciation. The bestial life that everybody has. Because we come, we come from the kingdom of the beast or the animal kingdom and we want to enter into the kingdom of the human being and the beast fornicates the beast enjoy the sexual act a beast and that beast is within all of us Without exception, when we are born, we receive the mark of the beast. Because we are being born through fornication, which means through the orgasm, the spasm, which is natural in the kingdom of the beast. But when we enter in this path, we receive the commandment, you shall not eat from that fruit. Because the initiator 
access to Adam and Eve. If you know how to handle that fruit, you will become like Elohim, knowing good and evil. And before that, Jehovah tells them, you shall not eat. So you shall not eat from the fruit, which is the fruit of sexuality. But then, of course, you know, Adam and Eve, who represents the initiation through Lucifer, they bite the apple. And by biting the apple, they don't enter into the kingdom of the human being, but just get involved again into the kingdom of the beast, because only the beast bite and eat the fruit of sexuality. The human being transmute the force, never releases the energy. And that's precisely the supreme effort to change our, our habits, our life, and to enter into another is what is precisely the secret of, the, of, of Tantra, the ordeal of water. But the one that controls the forces of Yesod, the forces of the waters of sexuality, is Lucifer. Lucifer is the sexual strength. What the Bible called Kerub. Kerub means strong one. The strength, the sexual strength is given by Lucifer. How it says that Lucifer gave the apple to Eve. But who is Eve? Eve are the sexual organs because Adam is the brain. Eve is the mother of the living. It is written, and the mother of the living are the sexual organs, because through the sexual organs we come. We come from the genitals of our father, we penetrate in the genitals of our mother, and in nine months we develop there, and finally we come out. That is Yesod. And the one that does all of that is Lucifer. But in the animal kingdom, Lucifer multiplies over, gives the instinctual sexual appetite to the beast. Everybody had that. And then gives the apple. What is that apple? <coughs> when you study the energies in the plant kingdom, you discover that the creative energy that goes through your sexual organs it is the same creative energy that passes to the apple tree. But it, the sexual force that passes in the apple tree is pure, chaste. That's why it's written, you shall not eat of that fruit, meaning you shall not waste that energy. In the plant, the energy is transmuted, and that's why you find beautiful plants and everything is a feast of light and perfumes among the flowers and trees but in the animal the animal stinks because releases the force that's the smell of the animal that's why you see that many things in the past that were very chaste, they were smelling like flowers. But we need to use some the other ends, because we need to be going to tolerate ourselves. Why? Because we are not chaste. So you see that, that that apple, when it says that Lucifer gives the apple to Eve, means that the force, or the sexual force, the sexual strength is given to the couple in order to perform the sexual act. It is simple like that. But if, if the sexual organ experiences the orgasm, and then is the, the, the consciousness is biting the apple, and the result of that is the, the, the releasing of the energy. 
And after that, the brain receives the outcome of that, which is Adam. Adam, the brain, degenerates. And because that action, instead of being born a human being, with knowledge about Keter, God, what is being born is Cain. No matter what you believe, no matter what you read, you want to enter into your own particular heaven. You want to develop. Because the only energy that creates is a sexual force. That's why the first ordeal is, is that the ordeal of the water. And of course that ordeal comes after and after in different levels. This is how you see it. All the great masters always, and the first step that they do is precisely with the waters. And from the waters they continue. As in any religion, I said, you receive the baptism, and then you continue in that religion. But that's a symbol. The real initiation begins when you get married. Because between men and woman is where is Lucifer, between Adam and Eve. Remember that when Eve takes the, bites the fruit, gives to her husband. People think that it's the woman given to, to the man. But it's not. It's a sexual organ. Eve given to the brain. But in order to perform that, they had to perform the sexual act. Adam and Eve had to perform the sexual act. But Adam and Eve are in each one of us, whether we are uh, masculine or feminine. That's precisely the, the mystery of the two polarities. The psychological and tantric work. Because tantra means ceremony, ritual that we have to perform. And of course, it's implied with different forces. We have to manage all the elements of nature. Because remember that the man that is created into the image of God is not an animal. He controls the kingdoms. He says that he is dominating the, the birds of heaven the beast of the earth. And that's something individually, internally. Because we have those elements within. It is written that after Elijah <coughs> confronts himself, an angel comes and feeds him when he is in the wilderness, trying to hide from Jezebel that wants to kill him. Of course, Jezebel is inside of us. By working with God is how we defeat it. And being careful because the mind is strong. Many initiates that enter into this path abandon the path. Why? Because of Jezebel, that's the only reason. You can call that uh, mind different names, but it's always Jezebel. You can call it the Pharaoh if you want, or Herod, the king. It's always the same. After that initiation passes, after that ordeal of water passes, and then the, a voice is here, the Logos, the Word of God, and ask Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? So you, you read that in the Bible. It's a question. What are you doing here, Elijah? The question will be also to every one of us. What are we doing here? What is not, uh, what are we doing here in this room? Or in this house? Or in the street? No. 
What are you doing here in this life? What is your purpose of life? What are you doing here? In Asia? And you enter into this path. You have to discover your mission. You have to discover yourself. That is not easy. But it is always step by step. It is written that Elijah decided to talk with God in order to receive help. And goes that in the in the month of the Mount Oreb. But if if you take that inside of you, of course, it's going up into his own head. In the pineal gland. He wants to go out of his body. By going out of the physical body he can go into the higher levels, higher sephirah. But he has to pass the other ordeals <coughs> it is written there in the chapter 19 of Kings that a strong wind comes when he is in, in the wilderness, in the mountain that shakes the mountain and that splits in many pieces all the rocks And Jehovah was not in the wind, he said there. When you read that literally, you said, what is the meaning of this? That the wind comes, and we know that the wind is Keter. It's called the great wind. Even the Mayans, they said related to Keter, they said, Huracan, which is hurricane. He says that is the first manifestation of God, according to the Popol Vuh, is the wind. But Jehovah is not in the wind. Then we have to analyze the ordeal of air. What is the ordeal of air? Ordeal of air is related to attachments. When you penetrate in your psychology, you find that you have a lot of attachments. The wind comes according with your karma. Because every ordeal that you have to face is in according what you owe. Your karma in the, in the last run helps you to face your own destiny, to face your own path. In this case, we will say that the ordeal of air is related with attachment. But it will be applied to me according to what, to my, with my karma. And to you, to your karma. Because each one of us has different karma, destiny. You all have different depths, karmically speaking. You can be attached to your family. You will suffer if some of your relatives die or when you are taken from your family and taken, for instance, hostage into another country. Some people won't suffer that because you're not attached there to their family. Maybe they are attached to other things. It depends what type of attachment you have. That's the way that the law will place you. Because when you enter into this path, you have to know yourself. You created your own karma, which is yourself. So therefore, facing your karma is knowing yourself, the reaction towards life. And that's why the mountain, the mountain symbolizes those elements, material elements to which you are attached to. But the wind comes and smash all the rocks in pieces. And then you lose Money, sometimes it's related to poverty. If you are afraid to be poor, you, can, you don't have money to pay the rent, to, make, to pay your mortgage. Maybe you think that you're going to lose the whole thing, and so what? Hey, <coughs> yeah, I see. Hey, yeah. That's why the first phrase that is coming to Elijah is, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
And uh, what is Elijah? My God is Jah. If you realize that sooner or later, you will lose everything anyhow. Because when you die physically, not even the physical body you will take. You will go to the ground. So what? My God is Jah. What are you doing here, Elijah? My God is Jah. Take everything from me. Who cares? God will provide. And all the stones are smashed into pieces. So, in only one time, many times, you acquire things and then you will lose them. But this is the way in which you will be tested. When you read any, the life of any prophet, of any master, it's always tested like that. Because you have to self-realize yourself and to realize that God is everything. But if you have attachments, if you are afraid because you want to lose your car, you are attached to your car. And that's why it's written there, and Jehovah was not in the wind. The wind of karma. Those winds of, that are taking your attachments. Because you created that. People said, oh, God is, oh, uh, how you said, uh, unjust with me. Because I'm being a good person, and look how he is treating me. I mean, the, the type of uh, uh, suffering that you receive according to the air. Because it's not God. If I take a hammer and, and beat my head, it's not God that is beating my head. It's, not, it's my hand. If I don't know how to handle, it's raining there, and I go and get wet, and I don't take precautions, I can be, have a cold. That's not God giving that cold. It's me, because I don't know how to manage my body. If I drink alcohol, and in the years I having a cirrhosis in my liver, it's not God. I drink the alcohol. So everything that we have is, is our karma. We made it. No God. And that's why I said God was not in the wind. But people always complain and point that God is unjust. You see, the earth in this day and age are passing for different cataclysms, tsunamis, earthquakes. There are, of course, the forces of nature accumulating themselves in order to establish and to save the planet. A planet that we, in general, are destroying. We are destroying. The smog. Did God create the smog? He created beautiful oxygen, beautiful air. But we are polluting the atmosphere. And after that becomes all these troubles. And when a tsunami happened, because earthquake or another circumstance, people go into the internet and blame God. When we created that. Everything that happens in this planet is because we created it. So we have to handle it. We want to be out of that fate. Then we have to work and to recognize that what we suffer, what we are going to pay, is our own karma. And not to blame God, because Jehovah was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But Jehovah was not in the earthquake, says that well. You see, what, what is the earthquake? Well, that is the ordeal of the earth. In life, we have terrible circumstances in which we suffer. Moments in which everything is against us. This will happen in an earthquake. And when no matter what we do, circumstances are always against us. <laughs> we are paying what we owe. But people always blame God. And that's why the teaching there very clear. Jehovah was not in the earthquake. Because if we are taking this path, 
is because we want to pay what we owe, the karma that we created in this life and previous lives. Nobody can mock the law. Nobody. There are some people there that they say that if they believe in Jesus, the old law is washed. And Jesus said, I didn't come to break the law, but to accomplish it. To help us to face our own destiny, our own karma. This is what Jesus said. Not in the words that I'm saying, but it's written there. To fulfill the law. But we don't want to do it, well, the law will be fulfilled anyhow. That's why Clippoth exists. The infra dimensions, hell, inferno. Where we go there in order to pay what we owe. That's why hell exists. Because we have to learn. As consciousness, we come in this world. We can mock the law, we can, uh, the, the physical law here, and to hide from this physical law that, we were, that was created by men. But from the law of God, nobody can, uh, nobody can avoid or, or be hidden. And that's why Jehovah was not in the earthquake. Because we created that. Our own particular individual psychological earthquake of life. But in this day and age, of course, there are physical earthquakes in different parts. And you know, in this area, everybody's waiting for earthquakes. But if we study cosmology in relation with Gnosis, we discover why it is a great fault here in the Pacific Ocean, in the coast. In general, each one of us is led with it. And then it's written there that after the earthquake, a fire. And Jehovah was not in the fire. Now here we have to understand also because God is fire. But the what fire is talking there? Is that fire of criticism? That fire of slander? The fire of hatred? And in this day and age, for instance, <coughs> there are many armies of Gauls, and in the name of God, they go and drop bombs in Iraq. All other groups, Muslims, that in the name of God comes and crash airplanes against buildings. And cause this type of terrorism, fire. Because fire is in relation with hatred, with anger. God is not in that fire as well. So God was not in the fire. But it's related with ordeals because it is Elijah there facing all of those one after the other. And this is how we have to suffer that. We have to face that. We caused many pain in the past by criticizing by doing things against people. Now the law of karma brings and the people criticize us, hurt us. Nobody receives anything that he doesn't owe. We pay what we owe. And that's the ordeal of fire. It's very difficult to pass the ordeal of fire because in the ordeal of fire you have to be patient and serene before the insulter. The Buddha Gautama Sakyamuni passed those ordeals. That's the story that he was meditated under the Bodhi tree. And Mara and his three daughters came to tempt him. Another attack. But he always meditating, comprehending his own karma, going beyond and accepting his own destiny. And that's why. It's written, love your enemies. They want to slap you and your right cheek give you the left. Because every cause has an effect. If somebody is hurting you, you have to understand why. Defend yourself, but without anger. But understand 
that anything that happens in front of your life, in your life, has a cause. And that cause is you. Nobody else. Don't, don't say God. By understanding the law of karma is how we comprehend the different ordeals that we pass. Because after the ordeal of fire, when Jehovah is not in the fire, he says, the voice of the silence comes. A very subtle voice. Hmm. Well, after all of that, so you want to experience and to hear your own particular individual Jah, your own God? Well, you have to pass that. You have to be patient. Because sooner or later, you will hear that. Subtle voice. And then we'll tell you again, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then you answer, well, I'm passing a lot of ordeals. And thank goodness, now I see you. But then you are out of your body. And then your God will tell you, return into the wilderness. Go to Damascus. It's written there. In anoint the king. Preach. Continue your path. Don't be afraid. Remember me. I am always with you. And this is how you continue on the path. And that's precisely what happened also with Jesus. After he passed the ordeal in the wilderness, he goes and starts preaching. And more ordeals come. Because Lucifer doesn't leave him there. Do you want to become one with God? Well, you have to annihilate your ego. And you have to die on the cross to finally rest rest. It's just the path of death. Death of the psychological animal elements that we have within, related with karma. Not the way of the cross. Not the way to be saved. And if you read the Gospels, you will see that it is not uh, sweet. I mean, you, you help others, but at the end, all of them will crucify you. You know, Jesus went meek to the cross and was crucified that way. The same way we have to go until we annihilate the whole thing, not to be attached to anything. Even forgiving those that hurt you. Because the karma is involved in everything. Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they do. And all, all of that is a development inside of us. Or oh, what happened with Elijah? After he finished all of that, what happened? It's written there. A chariot come from heaven and takes him out of the earth and disappears. That chariot is the Merkaba, the chariot of fire. All bodies created with fire. Obviously, Elijah created those bodies. The Merkaba is the astral body, the mental body, the causal body. Solar. Bodies that we have to create <coughs> when we learn how to transmute the sexual force. It has the only energy that creates. And as Elijah went up to heaven, in the same way we have to go up too. In the chariot of fire. And that fire is the fire of the Kundali. It has to be developed. But it develops, as you see there, it's written, through the ordeals. And that's why when you enter into this path, the first thing that you learn is that you have to confront your own Kerub. 
your own devil that you have within, that you created. And you have to decide to defeat it. And you continue, and God is with you. It's not easy. It's not impossible. If you forgot your God, then it's impossible. Because what is impossible to man is possible to God. You have to allow God to enter into your life. And this is a matter of working, developing those elements that you need in order for that force to come inside you. Because each one of us has, has its own particular job, its own particular keter. All the tree of life is inside of us. But in potentiality. And we need to develop that. And that's why this school exists. When you learn the, diff the doctrine that you have to apply to your own self. It's not a doctrine to believe. Because nobody will perform this transformation by believing. You can read all the books that we have here and memorize them. But if you don't apply the techniques, <coughs> you don't develop anything. There's many people, you know, that know this Bible by memory. It's coming into my mind now, this, uh, for instance, this uh, power of tongues. You know what is the power of tongues? To understand what is written here. That's a power, because this is the tongue of God, written with 22 letters. Of the Hebrew alphabet. If you all want to understand that, you have to have the power of tongues. In other books written in other languages, also you have to have the power of tongues in order to understand it, to comprehend that. People think that power of tongue is to to talk a very in a very how you call uh, bubble words without no sense. That's the power of the confusion of tongues, but not the power of tongues. Anybody can confusingly utter words. There are many groups there that that play with that. And they sometimes say something incongruent when they are preaching and they say, oh, this is the power of tongues. That's just... The real word is, in order to title that, it is Bolani. You know? you know? Hmm? Hysteria. The people when they don't understand oh, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit in, in Kabbalah is Bina, which means understanding, intelligence. Not confusion of tongues. The Tower of Babel, which is the head of those that don't develop intelligence, can utter all those words. With no sense, and say that this is the power of tongues. But I repeat, when you work in yourself, and then you st start understanding what is written here, and in all the other sacred book, that's the power of tongues. Then you know how to follow what is written, which is the guidance. Do you have questions? I have read um, your Jeff talking about the law of accident. I can't remember some of my own writing about that. I guess, <coughs> is that real? And if so, how does that relate to the law of karma? Well, sometimes the law of karma applies the law of accidents, or it's applied to the law of accidents. Because accident actually happens due to the fact that uh, in this universe not everybody is awakened. You can be awakened, for instance, uh, uh, driving your car and being aware of everything in order not to have an accident, right? Because you are guiding, you, you are conscious. But another person comes in the wrong way, which is not doing any work 
any psychological work and he's drunk. And then you are involved in an accident. Hmm? And then the karma is applying that because karma is applied in order to pay what you owe. Because you are working, maybe you will be assisted, but the other one has to die in that accident. And then you have to understand. When you are working on the path, you are conscious, and then you are dealing with your karma, and of course, you are out of the mechanicity of life. But other people are not doing it, and you are in the middle of that. And you have to understand that. That's the law of accident. So therefore, for instance, uh, there's a case uh, in this day and age where uh, fires happen. And then the fireman goes in order to appease that fire. Usually people, if you use their common sense, will think, oh, this fire. So let us go out of that because it's dangerous. But usually, instead of doing that, they go where the fire is. Because they are asleep. And sometimes they die because of curiosity. There's a saying there that says, the cat died for curiosity. And most of us sometimes are in danger because of curiosity. If we use our common sense and say if something has happened, let the firemen deal with it. And, uh, and really, but there are those, really those people that work as firemen that really help a lot of society. But if, if they ask me to work in that, I said no, because the law of accidents work in them. And sometimes they die by serving. But if you want to walk in this path, well, don't be a fireman. <laughs> because you can die in accident by helping. Because they are good intentions, really. They are reward because they are doing a service to humanity. If they die, they are reward after that in a new body. But it's a waste of time. You, you die and you have a new body, imagine. In the way that this humanity is so degenerated, do the work right now that you have the body. Because if you lose the body, you have to wait until that body is at least 20 years old, or 18, whatever. But before that, you have to face uh, friends, the school, and drugs, and all that. And who knows if you are going to overcome that. Because at least now you have experience and you are trying to overcome that. But in you know, other life, as the planet is going now, is really, each time is more and more difficult. So that's precisely related with the law of accident. We are in a world where accident is common. It's normal, even the abnormality. I think last night you said something about 3,000, and of those 3,000, there's 160. You know, I, uh, I said 3,000 cycles. In each cycle, 108. 108. 108. Each cycle implies mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, human kingdom. And the dissension into the infra dimensions in order to be clean of karma. So the, the in order to initiate another cycle. <laughs> But in each cycle, when you reach the level of human being, you have 108 opportunities to do what you have to do. That's, so you, you have 108 of the human cycles, and then from there on you can go into a whole new type of cycle development. Is that what? No, after 108, if you don't do what you have to do, which is the work that we are explaining here, you go into devolution. Yeah which is in the infra dimension what the people call hell or inferno, which is a retrogression into, into the steps of nature until your protoplasmic bodies are disintegrated, your ego is disintegrated, and your soul becomes pristine, pure, and clean again, in order to initiate another cycle. And, and that cycle would go through the plant kingdom? And 
on and on. Yeah. Mineral, plant, animal, and to, and to recuperate again the, the human state that you lost. Right. And 108 lives again. Right. I mean, this is the opportunities that the cosmos gives. 3,000 multiplied by 108 as reasoning. Right. Because before reaching the human kingdom, of course, you pass thousands of years in the mineral kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom, which is, is good. What cycle do you think you are at when you get to the human cycle? No, I don't, I quite, I, I'm trying to understand the 3,000 thing. I understand it builds up and stuff, but... No, it, it's, it's like a wheel. Okay. It goes always like this, right? And you jump out of that wheel. You got 108 and you go like this. It's always like that. Okay. Of course, this is a, the mechanicity of nature. But you can go out of the wheel by telema, willpower. It's the only way. That's precisely the, the insistence of many avatars, many messengers, to do the work. Because we are entangled in that, you know, vicious circle. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And there are many people that want to go out. And what they say, I want to be saved. Save what? Of that mechanicity, you know. But they don't, know, they don't know how to do it. It is a fight that you have to do it because those elements that are related to evolution and devolution are inside, you know, inside of us. We have to destroy them and to create new vehicles. That is what in Christianity is called to be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, which is the kingdom of the human being. But if you don't create those elements, which will be independent from the mechanical laws of nature, you cannot go out of nature. It's impossible. You spoke extensively this evening about the mysteries. And if I recall correctly, Jesus had mentioned the mysteries multiple times in the New Testament, but he referred to them by the mysteries of the Father and the mysteries of the Word. And I was just wondering if you could explain if there is a difference. I know that the logos being con would contain both the Father and also be named for the Word. So I was just curious if you could speak to, to that. The, about the mysteries of the Father. Jesus mentioned the mysteries, but he, when he spoke about them, he said the mysteries of the Father, but he also mentioned it again later as the mysteries of the Word. I'm just curious if, there, if it's the same thing. The mysteries of the Father and the mysteries of the work. Word. Word. Uh -huh. Yeah, are the same ones. Because the Father is in the Word of Malkut, hidden as an image within the sperm in the ovum. You want to develop the mysteries of the Father, and then you have to be in chastity. Because those mysteries or the image of God develops inside of you when you don't release the image. That is what is called in, 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 in Hebrew language the Thalem, the image. But that is within Nun. When you study the Hebrew alphabet, you find Nun, which means fish. And that fish is related with the sperm in the oven. Within the fish is the Thalem, the image of God. And in order to work with it, you have to be swallowed by the whale, which is the fish. And within the fish, you develop that. When you are vomited by the whale, by the fish, it's because you are resurrected. It's coming to my mind like what Jesus says. In order to, he said, this generation wants a sign. But only one sign was given, given to them, the sign of Jonah, who was three days and three nights within the belly of the well. The same way the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the center of the earth, which is the world. Hmm? Malkut. When you descend there into the center, you descend into the ninth sphere to work. It's easy to be swallowed by the well, to go into the center. The difficult is to go out, to be vomited, to be resurrected to become a new creature, a mutant, or we say a superman, 
who was superwoman. It doesn't work. And to descend into the center of the earth is to descend into your own sexual force and to work with it. And to stop losing the energy and transmuting, saving it, you know, and to create that within. But of course, the forces of nature will fight against you. Your lust is the first one. And not only inside of you, now you go outside to the internet, to the television, to the different ways. Lust is everywhere. To fight against that, you need a lot of dilemma. Nobody can help you but God. And that image of God is in your sexual energy. Because God is the force that creates. That is a mystery. Of course, the rest of the mysteries of God will develop inside of you in the measure that you transmute, that you advance internally. And then you are discovering the last. And who you are. And of course, it's a long path. The last time you mentioned Jesus' last words in the cross, the Maya, instead of the Mm-hmm. Well, in the Bible, uh, it says that when he says, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, it says that he's, uh, he says, God, God, my God, why are you forsaking me? But really, uh, Jesus spoke Maya. And Maya is similar to Hebrew. You know, uh, there are sim- similarities. And the fact is that the Hebrew language... The Arabic language, Chinese, Latin, Greek, come from the one root, as the Nahua, which is the language of the Aztecs, and the Maya, from America, come from the same root. And this is called the language that was spoken in Atlantis, which is the Watan. The language Watan is the root of all the languages of the world, before we were spreading in different languages. And that's why you find, if, uh, when you uh, study the different language of the world, the similitude of certain phrases mm-hmm. in the different languages. Uh, the great universal flood that is written in the Bible, it just is related with the story of this planet, of course, is the sinking of Atlantis. In the word, for instance, Atlantis, in Nahua, is atl, agua, water. The atl, you see. When you say Atlantic, we are naming the, 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 the name of that ocean is water, right? And also it's atl, 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 atlaloc, which is precisely the god of water. And Teotl is God in Nahua as in, in, in Greek, for instance, is Teos. It just had too, too much similarities. The God that was uh, holding the, the, the world according to the Nahua, his name was Atlanteotl, which is similar to the Atlas in Greece. You see the, the same Atla, it's the, the same root. So of course, is when you go, and if you experience that directly in meditation, you go into the past, into the Akashic records, and then you discover there that Atlantis existed, and is the root of all the present civilization. Do you have any other question? Did you understood? Yeah, you, um, understand. A little more the significance of forty, the number forty. Basically. Well, all the all the Hebrew letters have different uh, numbers or, or values, and the and the value of the letter mem, which is the M in English, is forty. Like the letter nun that we are talking here, for instance, which is related with fish, has the value of fifty. So when you find certain numbers written there, 
you have to associate those numbers with the letters in order to discover what is implying there. You find 40, 40, 40 is implying to mem, mem, which is water, water, water. Right? And then you know what are you reading. Otherwise, you, don't, you, you get lost. And of course, in the website there, in the internet, you have that uh, course that is finished now, that is called the 22 Arcana of the Tarot. And in each uh, Arcanum, you find the letter related with it, and the explanation of every letter. I have a friend that he says, I'm dedicated one month to each letter, to understand it. He needs 22 months, of course with the goal of getting into it. And of course, the 22 letters of so the Hebrew alphabet are the letters with which this book was written. But this is just a translation, right, from the Hebrew alphabet. So obviously, every single word written in Hebrew has a hidden wisdom. So you know you you should know how to read. You read just literally a translation, and most of the translations are made for people that do not understand the mysteries, that don't understand a little bit of Hebrew. And the, the, one of the great mistakes is that they read "In the beginning, God" is the first word of the Bible, and God is a wrong translation because God is El. Eloah is goddess. Elohim is gods and goddesses. So when it says the Bible you read in the beginning, it's a Berashit Bera Elohim. And Elohim means gods and goddesses. No God. It's not singular, it's plural. But the translators, because afraid of what the people believe only in one God, they put in the beginning God. Otherwise, they will be gone to their to the stake, to be burned for putting their gods in the God, but Elohim is God's plural. No one's many. But is that the multiplicity within the unity? Because Elohim is the multiple perfect unity. But this is something that we have to grasp. Yeah? Uh, I heard of Cowboys uh, one day interpret uh, in the beginning or Bereshit, Bereshit. Bereshit, yeah. Yeah, uh, as uh, uh, the A and the T, or in the beginning the A and the T, or in the beginning the alphabet, or in the beginning every vibration in the world. There are many interpretations uh-huh. of that Bereshit, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. They say the brain has six. If you count our six letters there, and that is the letter with the letter Bab, which is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the letter Bab is a mystery between the unknowable and the knowable, the two forces. It's really, the word Barashit has many appellations. Some certain things that in the beginning, wisdom, right? the wisdom of the Elohim created the heaven and the earth. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,